I'm Koyla Nassar. Have you ever asked yourself, how do I find God? How do I know there's a God at all? Well, we think that maybe we can help you in that journey. John Rigetti is going to be talking with one of the foremost theologians in the Orthodox world. His name is Father Thomas Hopko. He's Dean Emeritus of St. Vladimir's Seminary in Crestwood, New York. He's an Orthodox priest with the Orthodox Church of America. He's written countless articles, publications, and books, and is known worldwide for his knowledge of the Orthodox faith. And he's a much sought after speaker. We are so fortunate not only to have him with us today, but to have him living here in Greater Pittsburgh. And now for that ever important question. Father Tom, how do we find God? Well, how do we find God? I think I'd like to say, first of all, John, that um, according to the, to the scriptures, the Bible and the saints, uh, knowing God is everything. I mean, even Christ said, this is life to know the only true God. So if a person is not really knowing God or, or, or desiring to know God, we would claim they're not even living. They may be existing, buying, selling, whatever, but they're not living. Um, and here, I think also, just uh, kind of the most basic thing, in fact, I would probably say it's the essential thing. We could just get it over in two minutes here, uh, and that would be the desire. You know, the scripture says the search, the seeking, is everything. Uh, one saint of the church, Augustine, who lived in the West, but perfectly orthodox saint, he said, uh, if a person is seeking God, they're already blessed. They're already saved. <laughs> they're already found by God, which is the important thing, to be found by God, even to be found out by God, you know, not to flee from the face of God. Uh, but um, we would say if the desire is there, if there's a real authentic hunger and thirst for God, the face of God, you know, that's how the Psalms speak, you know, uh, as they say, you know, in, in uh, my soul searches for God like a, like a deer for the water or something like that. Early in the morning, I seek thee. With my whole heart, I desire thee. That's really the important thing. That's the only thing. God will figure out the way to do it. Now, I would say also, <clears throat> according to the scripture, if you, you don't necessarily need to use the word God at the beginning anyway. <laughs> because, you know, what is God? You know, when college students tell me they don't believe in God, I always say, tell me about the God you don't believe in. <laughs> you know, because mm -hmm. maybe I don't believe in that idol God either. Right. Uh, but if there is a thirst for reality for truth, uh, and never to be satisfied what is not God, <laughs> you know, uh, if there really is a desire to say, I want to know what it's all about, <laughs> and I want, to, I want to be found by God, I want to be a, a, in reality, in, in biblical language, uh, the psalmist would put it this way, not to be a fool. See, God looks down from heaven to see if there are any who are wise who seek after God. So seeking after God is everything. It really is everything. Even Jesus, I shouldn't say even, but Jesus Christ, whom we believe is our Lord and God, uh, in the Beatitudes, he said, blessed are they who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Sometimes it's translated justice, but vikiosini, it means what is right, what is real. They will be satisfied. He also says, keep asking and you will receive. Keep knocking, it'll be open to you. Keep seeking and you will find. And by the way, that's repetitive verbs. It's not ask for 10 minutes. It means be in an asking mode, <laughs> be in a seeking way. That's what makes you alive. And the claim is, that if, that, if, if the heart is pure, Jesus also said, blessed are the pure in heart, they will see God. <laughs> so if a person is seeking with a pure heart, that's everything. The rest is details. Now, of course, in the tradition and in, in the saints and in the scriptures, uh, they go further and will say, well, Suppose someone would come back and ask another question. Okay, I want to do that. What should I do? <laughs> Suppose I say, yeah, I want to find God. What should I do? And, and if the answer would be, well, seek God, then I say, okay, I want to seek him. What then should I do? Then you could have a whole list of things. Certainly but, Jesus would give us a whole list of things. <laughs> it sounds like, yeah. as you explore that, and particularly the relationship between God and man, that in a way, God is searching for us as well. Well, sure. I mean... Uh, I always point out, whenever I get a chance, and now I've got one, <laughs> uh, is that the first question to come out of the mouth of God in, in the Bible, in Genesis story, is, Adam, where are you? <laughs> Adam, where are you? So God really, is the looking very, for the us. The very first phrase is God looking for us. Yes, he is. 
In fact, uh, a great Jewish scholar, Abraham, uh, Joshua uh, Abraham Heschel, who taught for many years at Jewish Seminary in New York, which was just down the street from where I went to school at St. Vladimir's, um, he said, religion is a seeking after God. In Greek, even the word for religion, thriskia, which, by the way, is not even in the Bible. <laughs> I think it's there twice or something. It means a reaching up. And, and religion is a kind of a human endeavor. And this, uh, uh, Abraham Heschel used to say, and that's why the Bible is not about religion. <laughs> because the Bible is not the story of man's search for God or certain humans, the, I don't know, Israel or Hebrews or whatever. Oh, no, no. It's the story of God's search for man. It's not, it's not a human version of God. It's God's version of humanity that we believe is fulfilled in Jesus. In fact, we would say the real Adam is not that slimy, muddy creature that was formed in the beginning. According to the Apostle Paul, the first Adam was a typos, a type, a, a project that got screwed up from the beginning. <laughs> it never even got off the ground before it was crazy, and God had to say, Adam, where are you? you know? But the real, the real Adam is Jesus, the man from heaven. The first one is a typos of him who was to come. And so, you know, so for, for Christians, Orthodox Christians, every word of the Bible, which is the story of God's search for us, <laughs> is about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. <laughs> well, every the, word is about Jesus. The Bible then, surely there are signals from God. God sends us as mankind some signals, some ways to tell us He is searching for us. Oh, what sure. are those ways? Oh, millions of them. I mean, just millions. I mean, if you, if you took church fathers' writings, they would just say they're all over the place. Uh, I mean, let's just take like the, the most basic ones. You feel troubled inside yourself. You feel, gee, things aren't right. Or you do things and say, why did I do that? Or someone's acting in a certain way and say, that's not the way people should be. Well, we believe that's the remnant of God in us. Because one of the basic convictions of Christianity is that human beings are created male and female, katikona theu, according to the icon of God, in the image and likeness of God. For us, there's no definition of human life outside relation to God, and not just any old God, but the true God. And by the way, that's another thing about the Bible. The Bible is not about atheism and theism. It's about the true God and the false gods. <laughs> Because according to the scripture, and according to all the Christian saints, all the Christian saints would say, the real problem of mankind, of humankind, is idolatry, not atheism. Everybody has a God. Whatever you worship, whatever turns you on, whatever motivates you, whether, I don't know, it's scoring in bed or on a basketball court or whatever, that's your God. Making money, being on People magazine, I mean, whatever it is, that's your God. There's, there's, once I had to give a talk called... Um, 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 uh, how the heck was the name of this talk? I remember I changed the title immediately because it was something like um, uh, 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 True Life in a Godless World. And I played with it and said, listen, true life is a tautology. There, there is no life that's, unless it's true. If it's not true, it ain't life. <laughs> and secondly, the world is not godless. So really, the world there, is filled with gods. There are you know? no atheists. There are only people who, have, or who are idol worshippers yeah. or have yeah. some substitute for the true God. Exactly. And the whole scripture is about people worshipping the God that they have made. And, and, and that's the real important thing. Because, you know, the bottom line is we are e either, or I don't know if you say Western Pennsylvania, either, we are either worshipping God as God really is who made us and the 100,000 billion galaxies with the 100,000 billion stars, you know. Or we are worshiping the God that we have made up. And the Apostle Paul says that God could be your belly. St. John Cashin said another part of your body in the same general region, too. <laughs> that could be your God, and that's certainly a big God in America now. Um, or it could be money. You know, St. Paul says, flee avarice, which is idolatria, which is idolatry. So everything is about idolatry and the true God. That's how we would look at it. So you have your conscience, which is a kind of, and, and here we Orthodox, perhaps unlike some other Christians, we would claim 
that a person could never kill the image of God in them. No matter how much they sin, no matter how evil they are, even the devil can't do it. <laughs> um, and in fact, we would even say hell is the futile attempt to try to kill the image of God in you. <laughs> so there is an image of God in everybody, and, and God is doing, it's another conviction we have, God is doing everything that God can to make himself known to us. We clearly have a lot to talk about today. We do. And um, we have a lot more to talk about with Father Tom. Um, but first, I'd like you to hear a lot more about a very personal search. When we talk today about seeking God and God seeking us, we're going to turn it over to a young man who had his own search and share his personal story. Why do the Orthodox make the sign of the cross differently from others? A letter of Pope Innocent III from the early 13th century tells us that all Christians then made the sign of the cross from right to left upon themselves. This was in memory of the cross being traced on them by the priest at baptism, the priest signing from left to right. Clement Ferguson went on his own personal journey. He's with us today. And Clement, you were raised a Roman Catholic. You explored other religions. You were a Zen Buddhist. How did you find orthodoxy? Oh, it's a very long story, but I can try to give the condensed version. Um, basically, uh, I grew up Catholic, but I kind of fell away from the faith after some difficult experiences in life. And um, when it came time for me to pick on colleges, I decided to go to Point Park University downtown and uh, to be a computer science major because that was, you know, that's what I was good at. But I realized as I was doing this that it wasn't really fulfilling for me. I realized that I had a, I was really searching for something and I knew that I didn't want to spend my rest of my life doing computers. No offense to those who do that because <laughs> they're certainly smarter than me. So I figured that I would go out on a limb. Uh, I would transfer to Pitt, I would major in religious studies and I would try to find what it was that I was searching for. I just knew I had this, this great emptiness inside of me. And uh, at the University of Pittsburgh, I studied all sorts of different religions. And finally, I settled upon um, Zen Buddhism. I studied Japanese. I spent a semester abroad in Japan. And when I came back, it was time for my last semester. And I had to take a part of the requirement of the major is that you have to take a class on a, on a, a religion outside of your, you know, your area. So I took a class on comparative religion between um, Eastern Orthodoxy and Indian religion. And it was looking specifically at uh, mysticism in the religion, so like uh, the practice of prayer, looking at yoga, um, other such things. And through that, I came into contact with the writings of like the Desert Fathers and of, of monks and of mystics and of men of prayer. And I just saw a depth to Christianity that I never encountered before. And I thought, you know, I began to ask myself, you know, did I, maybe I dismiss this a little too early. You know, I, I didn't really, I grew up Catholic, but I didn't have much of an understanding of it. Well, how did you feel? when that happened. And that was the big thing because I would take this class and you know I really don't want to take this class in the first place because I said well you know I just want to focus on Buddhism this is my thing this is who I am I want to practice Zen uh, I don't need to study orthodoxy but I realized that when I would come out of class even if I wasn't paying attention because certainly I was jet lagged this was my you know right after I got back from Japan I just had this 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 feeling in my heart I just had this feeling like I had been weeping and in my eyes it would be really dry and it would just be this, this pain that was here. And there were a few times where I came out of class and I just began to cry. I just began to weep outside. So do you think that Father Hopko talked about that desire? Yeah. Do you think that's what it was? Yeah, but he also talked about the pure of heart and that certainly wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, yeah, I really did have, I was just, I was really searching. But even though I wasn't really searching for this, I felt that once I finally encountered orthodoxy that you know, my spirit within me, it, it knew that this is what I had been searching for the whole time. So what did orthodoxy have that other religions didn't for you? What did it have? I would really pinpoint it upon specifically that feeling that was within me, this resonance that I felt within my soul. The fact that I, I didn't want to do this, you know. I had spent, you know, the last four years of my life studying Buddhism, studying Asian religion. This is what I was going to do. I was thinking about either teaching or becoming a, a Buddhist monk. You know, I was very serious about this. And, and do, you here feel I had more this. do you feel more fulfilled now? Oh, yes, yes. Um, certainly, I feel a great sense of responsibility has been imparted to me. And I feel also a great sense of strength has been given to me that I felt I didn't have before. And certainly, I struggle. But um, after this experience, I just feel like a, a totally new person in a, in a much better way. 
I mean, I still have joy. I still have suffering. You know, I still have to go through each day as it comes. But I just have the strength of Christ within me, you know, and I hope I'm not too bold in saying that. But um, I really do feel um, his presence, and I, I could not deny that in my life. It's so wonderful to hear your story. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And, you know, stay with us because Father Hopko is going to be back and talk about how you can get some assistance, talk about what you can do on your journey. Why is Easter celebrated on a different Sunday each year? Jesus Christ's passion and resurrection occurred during the Jewish Passover. Therefore, Christians follow the Jewish calendar and celebrate Easter on the first Sunday after the first full moon after the spring equinox. The Orthodox also take seriously the ancient rule that the Christian Passover must follow the Jewish feast and not precede it. So in some years, it may fall much later than in others. I'm John Rigetti, and we're speaking with renowned Orthodox theologian, Father Thomas Hopko. Father, Clement's journey, was that a typical one? Uh, I would say that uh, all those journeys are basically the same, but everyone is different <laughs> because um, people are unique. There are no two people at all who are the same. Everyone has a unique face, a unique time, place, life, so it will always be different. It's like sanctity. Every, every saint is different, but in the general way, they are the same. They all have to love, but each one loves uniquely. Everyone has to search, but each one searches uniquely, given the own, their own conditions, their own providence, their own story. Uh, so I would say, yeah, when you hear what Clement is saying, you could say, yes, I've heard that over and again, uh, especially the element of the desire, the search, the sense of unease, and then all of a sudden this clicking, this is it. I would want to say, though, um, he used the uh, word feeling, and I'd like to comment on that a bit, because when most Americans hear feeling, they think of something emotional uh, or something, you know, I don't know, bells or something like that. And, and I think that what Clement was talking about, which you find uh, everywhere, I think the better word perhaps would be, I should talk with Clement about it, would be a kind of sense of conviction, a sense of certitude. It's, it's kind of an intuition, you know, like, that's it. It isn't like an emotional feeling, like all of a sudden. And even, even he did mention tears, which, by the way, in the tradition, it claims if you can't cry, you can't be saved. <laughs> you know, Jesus wept three times. Um, but there is this just sense of being grasped, of being, of, of, of being convinced, of, of kind of finding it, uh, that does break your heart. And it's interesting that in Scripture, the sacrifice to God is a broken heart. I like to say about liturgy that it has only one purpose, to break your heart. <laughs> to break your heart over the, the, the splendid mercy and beauty and glory of God and your own littleness, your own creatureliness, your own miserableness. But you put those two things together, and I think that's what happens every time. But it happens uniquely uh, in, 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 in various people. Also, it's interesting that, you know, uh, Quaylen and, and Clement were using uh, orthodoxy. But in fact, what he said was he found Christ. <laughs> you see, orthodoxy uh, sometimes can function like, you know, a thing in itself, some kind of thing called orthodoxy. But orthodoxy really is just, we claim, the gospel. It's the truth about God. It's, 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 it's um, how things are. You know, some people don't like that word orthodoxy. It sounds arrogant or whatever. But all it means is... God as God is, Christ as Christ is. And that can sound arrogant. However, if a person has that experience, nothing in heaven and earth is going to make them change their conviction about it. But I think it is a conviction. And here I'd like to give me a chance to say one more thing, John. This is, I think, one of the most important points that we could possibly ever make in our time now. C.S. Lewis, a great Christian writer from England, in 1944 wrote a book called The Abolition of Man. And he said that every culture, philosophical, religious, had this intuition of reality, of truth, that, that, that it was a faculty that makes us human. He said, if we don't have that faculty, then we're nothing but a brain and a body. We're a reasoning being with sense experience. But he claimed, and I won't go into the details of it, maybe another program we can, how modern education 
even grammar teaching in schools is eroding that intuition from a person. And he says, when that happens, people aren't human anymore. They're just a combination of a brain and a body. I like to say a, a computer and a consumer. Sometimes I even like to say a calculator and a copulator. <laughs> but that's all we are without that intuition. And I think what Clement testified to was he's still a human being because that he had intuition, this intuition. <laughs> that intuition is what he described as feeling. Yeah, that's, you know? what, that's where he was using the verb feeling, which some people could think, for example, the term heart in the Bible. When, when, when we Americans say heart, we usually think, you know, like, who was it who said, you know, the heart has reasons, the mind doesn't know, and so on. Well, that's not very biblical, and it's certainly not very orthodox. It's certainly not very Eastern Christian, because the Eastern tradition, Eastern Christianity, which is much closer to, to Judaism in that sense, the heart is that, is that place inside you where God testifies to Himself. It's that faculty of intuiting that gives you the axioms upon which you reason. But our modern Western world doesn't know this particular faculty practically at all. It's just reasoning on the brain like a calculator. Well, even Plato said a long time ago, that's a secondary action of the mind. The nous in Greek, which is the heart, the lop in he Hebrew, that's that intuition upon which you can then have a conversation. You can then reason, you can talk, you can even argue. You can argue with a Buddhist, for example, because you have a kind of intuition. I taught summer school a couple times at a Buddhist college in Colorado. It's a wonderful experience. And Buddhism, of course, is non-theistic. Um, uh, but in any case, there is a, a foundation in which a give and take can take place. And I think that in our modern world, by this subjectivization and the losing of this intuition, uh, then you just have you know, reasoning beings with sense experiencing, following their own experiences. And so then, this desire for truth, for God, people don't even know what you're talking about. So, you know, <laughs> if, if in our secularized society, if this trend is continuing, then how do I find God? I mean, if, if this intuition is being numbed, if you will, how does someone like Clement or me or anyone who is, so how do I find God? Well, C.S. Lewis, I think, would have claimed, we can be no longer human. It's possible. Now, we Orthodox might be a little more positive and say, well, no, no, there's always that element there that you can appeal to, that can break through, that God is there. We're kind of optimistic. Uh, however, I think that uh, some people like C.S. Lewis would say, for example, when he was describing this phenomenon in this book called The Abolition of Man, highly recommend it. It's a tough book. I read it six times. I still don't understand it. It's only this thin. But he, um, he when, when somebody, uh, when he said, and someone may say to me that you are calling these people evil or wicked, that they're, that they're a bad man. And he said, no, I'm not. What I am saying is they are no longer men, <laughs> at least in the classical understanding of what it meant to be human. Because we're not just a combination uh, uh, of a ghost and a corpse, as my theology teacher said, or a brain and a body. We are a, an incarnate spirit who has this quality of knowing God, of knowing truth, of rejoicing in it. That's what makes us alive. But then if uh, I'm and, not going to be fully human, I have to find God. Yes. I have to find oh, God. Oh, absolutely. I mean, Christians would definitely. And I would even go further. I would say a little more um, general. I think even all what you might call classical religions, Buddhism, Taoism, whatever they would be, Judaism, would all, would all say something like that. Even, even if you have Buddhism, which is non-theistic and basically philosophical, it is, not, it is not like Christianity in the sense that God speaks and so on. It's a hunger and thirst of Gautama sitting there for 4,000 years. But they would, all, they would all say that the goal is to find the, the truth of things to be authentic, to be real, you see. Uh, and, 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 and here, if we wanted to be really optimistic, I mean, certainly the Christian fathers, the Eastern Church fathers would say, the Holy Spirit and God and the image of God, who is Christ, is acting in all cultures, you know, in, in a, some kind of anonymous manner because we are creatures made in God's image. And so love and truth and beauty, these are 
are qualities of God Himself, we Christians would say, even though the Dalai Lama might say, well, we don't believe in a personal God. But we can say, okay, uh, you know, uh, your eminence, uh, but let's talk about truth, reality, life, grace. And then we can have a conversation. <laughs> we right. can really have a conversation, sure. you know. Uh, and uh, so I think that's important. And if I've not yet lost this intuition, this intuitive piece of me that, that begins the search, how do I begin that search? If I, if I still am human, uh -huh. if I still have this intuition, how do I begin my trek to find God? Well, I would say, I would have to answer as a Christian now, and as an, ortho, sure. as an, as an Orthodox Christian. I would say, I would repeat, the hunger and thirst for God any way you know how. So I would advise a person, pray. Now, you may say, well, I don't believe in God. So I'll say, okay, pray to whom it may concern. <laughs> say to God, if you are out there, or in here, because God is in here, not only out there, <laughs> right? Uh, but if you are, do something with me, okay? Another, th so I, I would say some type of prayer, because prayer is basically search. And by the way, I, I would just like to quickly add, you, you mentioned about beginning. Well, all the saints say you're always a beginner. Just when you get it together, you start doing it all over again. You know what I mean? It never ends. There's always another right. uh, level for right. the, in this search, you know, because God is even appearing different every day to us because God is boundless. And in fact, in our tradition, we wouldn't even say that God exists. I had good conversations with Buddhists about this because they were against the idea of existing being. I say, well, we agree with you on that one because our saints like Gregory Palamas would say, if God is, I'm not. If I am, God is not. But you can't speak about God as being. Being is a, is a creaturely category. Yeah, it's a yeah. creaturely category. God is beyond being. In fact, our fathers even say God is beyond God. Hypertheos, Dionysus says, beyond divinity. But anyway, the hunger and thirst, the prayer, then I think we would also definitely say, you have to practice silence. Yeah. I'm sure we will need to continue this discussion. I hope so. I want to thank you so much for You're your welcome. time today and for your insights. Um, it's been a very enriching discussion for us, and now I'd like to turn back to Quaylin. Well, no one makes it as easy to understand as Father Tom Hofko. You know, if you'd like to learn more about the Orthodox faith, listen to Orthodoxy Now, the radio show on WEDO 810 on your AM dial on Wednesday mornings at 9.30. That's hosted by Father Stevo Rocknich. And be sure to watch Orthodoxy Now on Comcast On Demand. We hope you'll tune in then. And if you have a topic that you'd like to know about, send it to Orthodoxy Now, 3400 Dawson Street, Pittsburgh, 15213. Thank you for joining us.